we don't know the time, the place, the hour when a prayer may be responded to, may be effective, and maybe that will come from faith, so-called. Maybe that will come from begging. Maybe that will come from anger. Maybe that will come from striking a bargain. You know, In New Thought, we're taught never to approach God with a begging bowl. But Arthur Mitch Horowitz says, never rule out any kind of prayer. Prayer might be effective and if you argue with God, if you're begging God, or even if you're angry with God. In the next part of our interview about Mitch's new book, Daydream Believer, Unlocking the Power of Your Mind, we talk about the very real limits of manifestation practices. And we also look at how the downs as well as the ups of life can move us closer to our dreams. You know, one of the other things that uh, you argue and have for a while is that that mind power has its limits, and mm -hmm. uh, and you um, in in this book you you note that there's countervailing forces and organic limits that people can encounter as they pursue yeah. their goals. And I was wondering if if you could uh, give some examples of of those limits and forces and that people may encounter. Sure, I. I... It's one of the toughest areas for me because for many, many reasons, which I articulate and go into in the book, I do believe that it is very possible that thought is the ultimate arbiter of reality. And, and yet at the same time, I cannot, as an observer, as a sentient observer, discount uh, the experience of seeing people undergo a terrible suffering in atmospheres of uh, either support and hope or atmospheres where the forces uh, arrayed against them like a natural disaster or a civil war are overwhelming and having never been through a serious national uh, natural disaster or a civil war, uh, I cannot judge what is going on in that circumstance. And I, I, I feel very strongly that New Thought or other practitioners should not be judging what's going on in experiences that they have not personally been through. And New Thought has traditionally been based here in the United States or other parts of the world uh, uh, where uh, things are, are, are usually going well enough for people so that they can sit down and read a Catherine Ponder book and ask, well, what are the dynamic laws of prosperity? Rather than trying to find out, where am I going to find shelter tonight? Where am I going to find water for my kids? Where am I going to find diapers because supply chains have been disrupted because I, I live in Yemen or I live in the Ukraine and there's this horrible war? You know, by definition, New Thought tends to not deal with issues of survival so much as issues of excelling. And so it's taken root in societies where we're doing okay, you know, compared to many people around the globe. And so <clears throat> I'm unsatisfied with uh, uses of the term law of attraction as one mental super law that determines everything that happens to everybody. I mean, for one thing, how would the, how would the person who holds that point of view defend that point of view. In other words, has, has he or she fled famines or uh, catastrophes or, or, you know, do you know what it's like to live in a village in the Philippines that gets wiped out by a hurricane or, or a tidal wave and would you be so comfortable? I, I mean, again, I, 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 how would you verify that as a universal principle? And I feel strongly that I used to say we live under many laws and forces, but nowadays I say we experience many different laws and forces. And I found that that comports uh, pretty well with the philosophy known as Hermeticism, which is an ancient Greek-Egyptian philosophy that grew out of the final stages of ancient Egypt, which has some extraordinary theological parallels to New Thought, but does a better job than modern New Thought of saying, look, uh, we live uh, within these uh, spheres of existence in which we undergo all kinds of physical limitations, including mortality itself. And while we are as the gods, as the psalmist says, uh, we die as princes, also found in the psalms. And we have to come to grips with the fact that while we do have a causative creative function, 
uh, within our minds, I believe, uh, we are faced in this particular sphere of existence with physical experiences and limitations that make us prone to injury, mortality, uh, violence, um, uh, natural disasters, uh, and not to mention all kinds of social and economic occurrences over which the individual has very limited control. So uh, I can't say that I have ever heard from any practitioner of New Thought a convincing case that uh, one mind controls all because that individual hasn't been through all. That also <clears throat> brings to mind that the, another thing in, in the book that, that struck me is that Orthodox New Thought can make sort of the normal ups and downs of life uh, feel like we're failing for not manifesting the life of our dreams. Yes. And and you refer to those ups and downs as, as normal swings of a pendulum that can actually move us toward our goals, which is, is a must. And I think that speaks to what you're talking about, this larger perspective on this side of life that Hermeticism offers. And I was wondering how we can work with that idea of the, of the pendulum. Well, it, it strikes me that life is heavily rhythmical and that we do go through experiences that we perhaps would never uh, wish to repeat and, and that we give anything to get ourselves out of. Um, and yet those very same things, it, it seems to me, frequently rhythmically deliver us to a place of refinement, maturation, and strength that we wouldn't have been in. For example, this very book that you and I are discussing, Daydream Believer, um, would never perhaps have gotten written if it weren't for a tragedy that I experienced in my life. Um, uh, some time ago, I experienced uh, what I considered a, a, a betrayal by a business partner, and something that I thought I was going to be work on, working on went bust, and I was very unhappy about it, and yet, within that vacuum, uh, stepped the the insight, the inspiration, whatever it was, to start writing Daydream Believer. And I'm speaking to you uh, on the first or second day of summer in 2022, and I began writing this book um, in spring of 2021, so just a little over a year ago, and here we are talking about it. It's a very meaningful book to me because it's not only the most uh, deeply honest and I think powerful book of practical writing that I've ever done, but it is a book that I hope will attain some posterity. And I wouldn't have had that if I had gotten the candy that I thought I, I wanted. And that doesn't mean that in, in losing the candy, uh, I didn't suffer unhappiness. Of course I did. And that doesn't mean that I, I necessarily want to go through that again. But um, it did deliver me to a place that I never could have foreseen and that I probably wouldn't have reached if it hadn't occurred. So there is a compensatory element to life. And I ask people to watch very, very carefully for that in their own experience. In the, in the chapter on prayer, um, and I think this, I think you wrote uh, that sometimes it, it takes despair or near despair. Yes. Uh, in order to, to move forward on these kinds of things. And I've studied uh, Jewish mysticism for many years with an Orthodox rabbi, and he's often talked about the importance in some prayers of begging, uh, you mm. know, being yes. on the floor and, 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 and it, I, I mean, it's like I, I appreciated it, but I couldn't understand it. But your chapter on prayer and also uh, your thoughts on the, on the pendulum swings, I think, moves me closer to understanding it. And, and you write in your prayer chapter about having a, a, an instance where uh, both you and your partner had used this approach to prayer. So I was wondering what your experience with that was in terms of begging and, and why you think it works. Well, one of the hang-ups of New Thought, it seems to me, is that it tends to have a very monolithic view of prayer based upon certain lines from the Old Testament, compelling lines, pray believing that y you have and so you shall. 
So that ignited the New Thought imagination very, very deeply uh, in the, we'll say, mid to late 19th century when modern New Thought began taking shape uh, in New England in the United States. And I recognize that that is a compelling formula, and I recognize that it has hallowed roots and probably has correspondences with other uh, equally hallowed uh, statements or utterances or philosophies or outlooks. But at the same time, uh, if you want to use scripture as your antecedent, there are dozens of different kinds of prayer in scripture, including what your teacher was describing, begging, being angry, insisting, arguing with God. Cain argued with God. Um, Adam and Eve argued with God. Uh, uh, Sarah argued with God. Jonah argued with God. And in some cases, uh, uh, the being called God in Scripture changed its mind, you know. And, and so you have all kinds of different antecedents for prayer in Scripture. So if you're scripturally based, why settle upon that one? But that has become the monolithic New Thought approach. And in addition to what I write in that chapter, my feeling is that, look, I honor that our ancient ancestors identified personified, deified different energies within nature and sought relationships with these energies, including petitionary relationships. And it struck me that we don't really know, uh, if I can make a leap of faith here, how the invisible world works. You know, assuming that most of the people engaged in this exchange share our conviction that there is an unseen world, there is unseen cause, extra-physical, me metaphysical. We don't really know how it works. And we comfort ourselves with this no notion that we know how it works because, well, look, it's right here in Scripture, case closed. And every individual has to verify things as best as he or she is capable. And my feeling is, since we don't know how the invisible world works, we don't know how it works in terms of timing, we don't know how it works in terms of intellect. We don't know how it works in terms of relationships. We don't know anything about it. You know, we capture glimpses perhaps through experience and, and then maybe that experience doesn't repeat and we are left asking ourselves, why not? Or was it real or what have you? But since we don't know how the unseen world works, you know, so to speak, we don't know the time, the place, the hour when a prayer may be responded to, may be effective, and maybe that will come from faith, so-called. Maybe that will come from begging. Maybe that will come from anger. Maybe that will come from striking a bargain. You know, Scripture is, as my friend Richard Smoley has pointed out, Scripture is filled with instances of people making deals and bargains uh, with the unseen. You know, I'll do this if you do this. And, you know, I vow this if you do this. Lots of those as well. So I'm not saying that that has to be one's antecedent, but if it is, take a good hard look at what's in there because there's a lot of different forms of prayer. And since we must acknowledge we don't know, that we don't understand the machination of the unseen world, I think it stands to reason that we're making a pretty good bet, pretty pretty good bargain um, if, if we're willing to pray continuously, anytime, all the time, and using different methods. Um, uh, a skeptic could argue that I'm just courting coincidence. He doesn't know that. I don't know that. But what I do know is we're unsure of the workings of the unseen world. So if one feels the same conviction as I do, uh, then I think it stands to reason that um, you make a continual effort, never knowing the time, place, and hour where that effort may be rewarded. What are your thoughts on prayer? What's worked for you? Leave a comment below. This has been the second part of a four-part interview series with author Mitch Horowitz about his new book, Daydream Believer, Unlocking the Ultimate Power of Your Mind. Next up, we'll be talking about Mitch's idea about how mind power works and why he thinks UFOs and ESP are close neighbors to the phenomenon of our minds being able to shape reality. Make sure to hit subscribe and like this video below. It really helps keep producing content like this. Also, be sure to visit my website, harvbishop.com, where there's more than 160 articles on manifestation, new thought, new thought and social justice, and the paranormal. 
We talk about exploring emerging ideas that transform our lives. Links to the heartbishop.com website and to Mitch's new book are in the sections below.